All right, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, we're talking about what to do when faith seems weak and victory lost. Hallelujah. And, and I'll tell you, the, the weakness of faith is a perception many times that you can't win, you can't overcome. When the truth of the matter is, Jesus said, if you've got faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed. Yes. Amen. And faith is so powerful, it don't take a whole lot. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Are you here? Praise God. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. We talked about this morning how that it's just in your spiritual DNA to win. You're designed by God to win. It's your nature to win. You're, I mean, it's just, it's just kind of in you. How God created you is to win. Now, Satan can rob you of that belief, and Satan can rob you of functioning and operating in that, but it doesn't change what God designed you to do. Amen? I mean, you know, you design cars to run and to, and to drive down the road. Now, you can go mess that up. You can pull the plug on the alternator. You can you know, punch a hole in the gas tank. You can shoot the tires out. And it'll mess it up from doing what it's designed to do. And see, Satan wants to get in your life and mess you up from doing what you're designed to do. And that is be a winner. Amen. You're designed to be a winner. So, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Or you can say it this way, this is the victory that overcomes the world. That is our faith. This morning we talked about, and so, so faith, faith is the key to victory. Living a lifestyle of faith is living a lifestyle of victory. Talked about this morning, uh, recognizing the source of two things. One is the problem. The other is the answer. All right? And so we spent time talking about how that, and gave you scriptures, John 10, 10, 1 Peter 5, 8, and Ephesians 6, 12, how that Satan is the source of your problem or whatever you're dealing with. Amen? Not, not another person, not a bad bank account. Not, Satan is the source of what you're dealing with. God is your answer. Amen? Amen? And so we talked about that this morning. You're going to have to go back and listen to it online. Or, uh, unless you're a special case, you get your own personal CD. Other than that, hallelujah, you got to go, you'll go out to the internet, get online, look to our site, download it, video, pat, cut, pat, uh, video cast it. What is it? Video podcast? How's it go? Video podcast, audio podcast, YouTube, it, or Roku box. You can get us any of those places or stream right off the website. All right? Go back and listen to this morning. It'll make you happy because it preached me happy. Amen. Tonight we're going to cover the second point of what to do when faith seems weak and victory lost. Now I said this morning, this is not an original Ed Taylor sermon. Dad Hagen used to preach it. Then we talked about how Dad Hagen got the points out of Dates Annotated Bible. They're right there in one of the little side things, 10 things to do when faith seems weak and victory lost. He took that and preached a series out of it and became awesome. Amen. You know, so we, we, could, we can get stuff, we can glean from each other and then bless people with it. Amen. Hallelujah. So second point of what to do when faith seems weak and victory for loss. First one was know your sources of, of the problem or the answer. The second point is be sure <clears throat> the promises of God cover the things you ask for. Don't ask for stupid stuff. Don't ask for things that aren't covered by the Word of God. Amen. You go asking for stuff that's not covered by the Word of God, you're not going to get answers. Well, what do you mean? You can't believe for my wife. Now, two things there. The Lord and I will get involved. Okay? Just how it's going to be. You know, me and the Lord are going to get involved. I know a preacher one time, <coughs> actually, excuse me, he was pastoring, and one of the men was hitting up on his wife. One of the men in the church was hitting up on his wife. He went to the Lord in prayer. He said, Lord, that's okay. I know you said in the word that vengeance is mine. I will pray, saith the Lord. He said, but I got this one. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You can't ask for things. Here, here's, here's, here's just your good rule of thumb. If the Bible don't say it, you can't have it. Unless by the Spirit of God he tells you that, and that will still be in harmony with written Scripture. Okay? You know, well, like I told you a couple weeks ago, I, had, we were, uh, I was at, in the office one day, this girl called. She called me up and said, well, I, I, I want to talk to the pastor. I said, well, you've got him. I'm, I'm Pastor Taylor. I'm, 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 you know, I'm the pastor of the church. She said, well, I need to ask you a question. I need some counseling. And, and I said, well, okay, then are you a member of a church? Yeah. I said, now, now, why haven't you gone to your pastor? Well, I can't go to him with this. Well, that's a red big, 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 big 
You know how we sing that song? Love is the flag flown high on the castle of my heart. That is a big red flag over the pastor's counseling session, all right? Hallelujah. I mean, right then, you know something's up. She can't go to her pastor. Well, she begins to talk to him about how that, you know, God has showed her that this man in the church is supposed to be her husband and that they're supposed to get married and all this stuff. So I start asking her some, some, just some real basic questions. Well, have, have you guys dated? No. Uh, has, he, has he shown any interest in you? No. Have y'all gone out on the, you know, <clears throat> have y'all had any contact? Well, not really, you know, but God showed me. And I messed around there for about 15 to 20 minutes. And finally, she said, well, when I finally tried to press her down about, well, um, have, you, have you expressed your feelings to him, whatever? Da, da, da. No. And I finally got down to the, to, to the um, nitty gritty. Y'all know what the nitty gritty is, don't you? Got down to where the rubber meets the road. And uh, she, she finally said, well, to be honest with you, uh, he's married. You're calling me, saying God showed you you're going to marry him. He's happily married in the church. He's with his wife. He ain't shown no signs of being interested in you. And God's going to break him up with his wife and put him in, and give him to you. Yeah. I tell you, before I could think, and it just came out of my mouth before I, before I had a chance to put a filter on it. And probably that's because God didn't want me to have a filter on it. I said, you ate too much pizza last night. Yeah. That was an indigestion dream. Now I know why she couldn't talk to her pastor. The man was an elder in the church. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry's laughing already. Man's an elder in the church, a leader in the church. <clears throat> and, she, she, and she goes to the pastor and said, the Lord said, I'm supposed to marry elder so-and-so. He probably booted her out the back door. He might have called her Jezebel on the way out or something. I don't know. I'm not sure what he would have done. But you know what? There's no promise for that. Brother Hagin came back one year from um, Christmas break. This is, now this is pre-81. It may have been 81. I can't remember if it was our year or the year before, but 80, 80, 80, 80, 81 Christmas break or 79, 80 Christmas break. I just don't remember. I was here at the 80, 81 Christmas break. So it was either the end or the one before. He said he came back and, he, he, and, the, and the board at Raymond Bauer Church or Camp Hagen Ministries at that time had bought him a Ford Bronco, big, you know, one of the big SUVs. And back then that was a big thing. That was a cool thing to have. You know, big old trucky, clunky looking SUV. And Dad Hagen had his. He drove it up one day and parked in his parking spot. And a Rama student, bless their darling hearts and stupid heads, still needing to learn a bunch of stuff, heads. Walked by and said, take care of my Ford Bronco. <clears throat> and Dad looked at him and said, what are you talking about? He said, I, I, the Bible says you can have what you say. So I told the Lord and confessed and believed that I received that Ford Bronco as mine. There's no Bible for that. As a matter of fact, there is Bible about coveting your neighbor's goods and possessions. All right? Dad said, well, I got something to say about it because it's mine. He said, and I've already, I've already talked to the Lord. He told me to keep it. You know, you bonehead, you can't believe for somebody else's vehicle, their house or whatever. Are you here? You don't have Bible for that. Well, I, whatever I say, listen, when Jesus said that what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them, remember, remember, he said in verse 22, he had the faith of God. Now, didn't he? Didn't he say, remember the story, verse 12, um, uh, as, as, they were, as they were out, the Bible says as he, as he went, he, he hungered, and after he hungered, remember they'd gone in and run out the money changers and all that stuff. <clears throat> and after he hungered, and he saw a fig tree afar off having leaves on it, and he came happily he might find figs thereon, for the time of the figs was not yet. Now, the, the thing was, when a fig tree uh, had leaves, it had figs. It had gotten figs out of season, with, and it was, but it was barren with no fruit. But Jesus went, the Bible says, if happily, by chance, just, you know, okay, it's not supposed to, but it's got leaves, so it's telling me it's got figs. He goes over to the fig tree. And finds no fig so on it. He says, he says unto the fig tree, No man that eat fruit of thee hereafter forevermore. And the disciples heard it. And it goes on. Then it gets down to verse 22 or verse 21. And it says this, when, as, as they passed by, Peter calling to remember it, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. In verse 22. And Jesus answering saith unto him, Hallelujah, over Mark. Mark, Mark 11, verse 22. Jesus saith unto him, have faith in God, or you could translate that because of the way that the Greek structure is, have the faith of God or the God kind of faith. 
So that means that 23 and 24 are talking about, or, or, or follow, they didn't jump out of nowhere. They're in connection with have the faith of God. Amen? So what does that mean? When he says, what things, for verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be that, verse 23, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. I can have what I say. But you could only have what you say in conjunction with the faith of God. That's, 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 then that's what I'm going to next, because Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So then, Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24, Romans 10, 17, makes it very clear that faith can only operate within the parameters of what God's Word promises. Yes. Now, I said the Spirit of God can speak to you, but remember, the Spirit and the Word agree. It's going to be within the parameters of the Word of God. Amen? So you just can't go out here and see, people just take a scripture out of place. I have what I say. You can only have what you say in conjunction with the fact that it is, it is birthed out of the faith of God, and the faith of God is birthed out of the Word of God. Amen? you got to have scripture to cover what you're believing for. Too many Christians take something like a Mark eleven twenty four, 24, and you know, well, Dad Hagen taught that. He, you know, he didn't. He didn't think you could have anything you wanted. You're lying on him. You just can't go out there and get anything you want just, you know, because you heard him say, well, Mark 11, 24 says, believe that, you know, what things shall you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you'll have them. I've got it now. It's mine. Hallelujah. <clears throat> You've taken a statement out of the middle of a sermon or a middle of a teaching where there's a foundation that it was laid upon. Amen. Now, here's the deal. If you came in and started videoing a home being built halfway through and then went out and showed people this is how you build a house, you got problems. Because you didn't show them how the foundation was laid. And you didn't show them what was done before that point where you started filming. Are you here? So what you've got is, if you start building a house halfway through and you don't do all the other things that went before on that other house, yours is going to fall. Because it wasn't built on the foundation. It wasn't built right. Well, this, I'm, I'm telling you, this is exactly what they did. Yes, it is what they did after other things had been done. Yeah. And see, somebody will jump in and hear part of a message. You can have what you say. There might be a five, it might be a five-sermon series on receiving from God, and one of the sermons is you can have what you say, but you didn't come for sermon one and two. Meditating in the Word, getting scriptures that cover your promise, meditating in the Word, building the foundation of faith, and now you're acting. They could have been on the acting part without the other parts. And don't take the time because that part excites them. Now, let me ask you, how many, how many of you ever had a home built? You know, you, know, you, were, you were buying a home, you had it built. I, I have. Boy, it's exciting. It's exciting to go out there, you know, each step of the way. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When you go out there and the ground's all messed up, when they came with the backhoe and dug out the footers, you know, and you kind of look at it, and you think, man, that just don't look it's gonna be like, like it's going to be that big. How many of you ever, you know what I'm talking about? Or you've been on a construction site. When you see the footers, you just don't think there's any way in the world it's going to be that big. Foundation work's never fun. It's the most important part of the whole process. Without the right foundation, the rest of the house can't stand. Amen. You don't get that foundation right, it can't stand. That's why I do soil tests, because if the soil isn't right, they've got to put rebar in there and everything. They've got to do all kinds of stuff to shore it up so that when the house is put on that, it won't settle wrong and won't do weird things. You've got to get that foundation right. What's the foundation? His Word. His Word. Have the faith of God. Now, the faith of God works this way. Remember, Jesus said, have the faith of God, and then taught him how it works. But then there's a lot of other Scripture that teaches us how to get it, and how to feed it, and how to develop it. You can't take something out of the middle of something and run off and start believing God for stuff that the Bible doesn't promise you. You just can't do it. Well, I, I heard so-and-so say, you can have it. I got that book from Brother Hagin. You can have, you said, a little mini book. Yeah, but he did a whole lot of other teaching around that. 
Hello? That's part of the process. It's not the whole. So, let's find Scripture. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Let's find Scripture that covers what we need from God. Well, I've done all that before in the past. Look, you know, yesterday's manna won't feed you today. As a matter of fact, yesterday's manna will rot. Go back and study. Go back and study. Remember? People want to throw the Old Testament out. The New Testament says that the Old Testament was written as an end sample for us. It's an example to us. And there are allegories there <coughs> that are for us today in the church so that we don't do wrongly. One of them is that yesterday's manna, so, so they could only go, gather up enough manna for the day because if they kept too much, it would just rot. They had to go gather fresh manna every day. The only day they couldn't do it, they got away with that was it lasted through the Sabbath. When they gathered on the Friday, it lasted through the Saturday, but on Sunday they had to go get it again. Saturday was, it was the Jewish Sabbath. Sunday is the first day of the week. That's why we celebrate and have church on Sundays because it's the Lord's Day. It's the day He was resurrected. Okay? That's real simple. You have to get fresh manna. So just because you walked in things 15 years ago, don't be cut the mustard for today. And because you studied something a year ago about something, doesn't mean it's going to be fresh today. You've got to stay fresh. So when you're dealing with something, I, I've heard, I heard Dad Hagen say this. He, he need to pray about something. And although he knew all the scriptures, he could quote them all, he would meditate on them several days before he would ever start acting or releasing his faith. He just sit, he, he lay that night, take extra time, med quote those scriptures, go back and look them up, look over them again, confess them, meditate on them, speak them, you know, build himself back up, and then he'd go act on his faith. Amen? Make sure everything was right, make sure everything was in line, then he got off on it. We're too lazy. I know that's hard. Well, that's harsh. It's fact. We live in an instant society. Now, I am sitting here right now with my, my, all my Bible notes on this little book. I got a Bible on here. I got all my notes on here. I'm on the internet. Don't believe me? There's Facebook. All right. Hallelujah. God done it says this. Okay, tag, you know. I mean, you know, just did, Trina Hankins says, the, okay. There's all kinds of stuff on here. I'm on the internet. At speeds of, what are we, we were 6 meg up and, six, and six, 12 meg down or something. I remember the day that you had these dial-up. Now listen, forget, forget your PC dial-up modem. We're talking pre-PC. We're talking about system 32s and 36s and system 3s and 38s and mainframes on dial-up modems at about 10K, I think a minute. I don't know if it was that bad, but it was, it was slow. 300 bald. 300 bald. Okay. Was that 300K? With an acoustic couple, yeah, because they had to suppress some, the noise on the line so it wouldn't mess up the data as it went down the telephone line. It was all analog. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. We live in an age that we don't cook our fried chicken anymore because that takes a good hour or so to batter, fry, and get enough chicken for the whole family. We run the bohunglies. Get it in, get it in five seconds. That sounds good to me. Hallelujah. We don't cook lasagna at home. Of course, we did yesterday. We're having leftovers for supper tonight when we get home. We, don't, we, go, to, and, and, uh, we go to Olive Garden. Of course, we went and bought the Olive Garden salad dressing at Sam's and made salads with it. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, so, but people, you know, we, we want everything else. We have instant mashed potatoes. You don't have to make biscuits from scratch. You just pop a can, stick them in the oven. Are y'all here? You don't have to make, you don't have to make bread. I mean, if you, if you want to be real fancy, have fresh, fresh baked bread, they sell you uncooked bread in the grocery store. You can put it on the slab and it'll rise and cook. Right before your eyes. Rolls. They got yeast rolls that, you, that are frozen. Let's set them out 24 hours in advance. They'll rise up, put them in the oven, cook them. They're like fresh, fresh made rolls. Everything geared in society is about convenience and no effort. Laziness is the mother of invention. 
I'm not sure if that's the right saying, but let's face it. Why are things invented? To make things easier. Somebody comes up and goes, we can do that easier. And they invent something to do it. My dad, at, 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 at his house that he had in Aden before they moved to Myrtle Beach, had a, had a party barn. It's bigger than my house, my first house. Out back, and it's two-story, and they just put all the Christmas stuff, all the lights and all the stuff from the yard up there. And he got tired of going up and down the steps. So he went and got him and fixed him an elevator, basically. He had a pole. He had, he had, he had wheelies with cable on it, and they came down, and they, they branched off, and he had this, it's basically a dumb waiter. He made a dumb waiter. He flip a switch, and he goes, Neeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
if we're going to talk about your grandfather, he needs healing in his body, then we need to find Bible that covers healing. So I gave him, I went out 1 Peter 2, 24, Isaiah 53, 5, and, and Matthew 8, 16, 17, and went over that real quick, and, and, and you know, in short lesson, as much as you can do in, a, in that kind of setting. I said, now, if you're going to pray effectively, we've got to know it's God's will to heal. Amen. And so I just covered that real quick, and, and the teacher that was sitting in there was not, you know, she got it walked out. You know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, uh, she doesn't like what I'm saying, but I don't care. You know, I'm subbing. I, you know, they, what's they can do is not have me sub anymore. That's right. All right? But I can, do, I can do more damage to the devil in this for three minutes than, than they can undo in six years. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. And uh, I said, listen, some people take things as spiritual healing. It's not. Some people think, you know, I said, Matthew 8, 16, 17 makes it very clear. It's not spiritual. It's physical. When Isaiah and First Peter are talking about physical ailments. I said, now we're going to pray for your grandfather. And we, we, I prayed a prayer of faith. Well, I had a Bible basis to do it. You've got to have a Bible basis for what you're believing God for. Let's look over, uh, if we will, over to 2 Corinthians chapters, chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Y'all getting blessed? Hallelujah. We're going to read this out of the King James, the Weymouth, and the Amplified. All right? King James, Weymouth, and Amplified. But as God is true... Our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Sylvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay. But in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now, I grew up classical Pentecostal. We used to have a saying, God answers prayer three ways. Sometimes yes. Sometimes no, and sometimes maybe. And that statement is utterly false. Let me say this. If it's Bible prayer, it's based on the Word of God. God never says no to His Word. If you're just feeding the plants, He don't have to say anything. What do you mean feeding the plants? I said, oh God, I need for you to hear me. If you're praying outside Scripture, He's not going to respond. God, heal him if it's your will. You know what you just told God? You hadn't been diligent. Because if you spent time in the Word, you'd find out it was his will. I'm not, I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to get, you know, you want answers? You want to know why things aren't working? Here's, here's an answer. And if you'll fix this, things will work for you. Faith will work for you. You'll get answers to prayer. Amen. Let's read this out of the Weymouth first. It sure does help, help throw a little light on there. As certainly as God is faithful, our language to you is not now yes and now no. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he who proclaimed among you by us, that is by Silas and Timothy and myself, did, I love this statement, did not show himself a waverer between yes and no. Yes. Oh, I love that. I love the way that's stated. Did not show himself a waverer between yes and no, but it was and always is yes with him. Hallelujah. For, listen, why? For all the promises of God, whatever their number, have their confirmation in him. Hallelujah. And for this reason, through him, also, our amen. What does amen be? mean? So be it. It's a, it amen is, a, is an acknowledgment of agreement. Our amen acknowledges the truth and promotes the glory of God through our faith. <coughs> Hallelujah. Now, in, in the, the study notes, you know, some, some of these guys, when they wrote, wrote their Bibles or their translations, would, would, would mark stuff, and then they would put ex explanations over in, in, in subnets. Well, Weymouth did that. And here it says, where it always is, the yes with him for, um, <coughs> let's see here. Where is it? In, I'm trying to find it in the uh, Amplified. It says here, where it says, uh, it is always yes with him. It says this, it's literally the yes. That phrase is literally the Yes. In other words, it, it, is, it is a solid affirmation that God's Word is always yes. When you take God's Word by faith, the answer is always yes. Yeah, Amplified says divine yes. 
the Amplified says, As surely as God is trustworthy and faithful and means what he says, our speech and message to you has not been yes, that that, that might mean no. <laughs> How many have ever that? Yeah, which really mean no. God doesn't operate that way. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ the Messiah, who has been preached among you by us, by myself, Sylvanius, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it is always the divine yes. For as many as are the promises of God, I'll find their yes in him. And for this reason, we also utter the amen, so be it to God through him, in the person and by his agency to the glory of God. That's amplified. But I, I just, I always love this little phrase in Wayman that says, did not show himself a waverer. When you go to God with his word, now see, listen, if you don't go to God with his word, you got a problem. Hello? <laughs> That's where you get the no. Actually, I think most of the time you get a you get no response. Yeah. Yeah. That is a silent treatment. And all everybody knows what that means, no. Yeah. When you go to mom and dad and say, can I get a piece of pie before I go to bed? They just look at you. That's not a yes. That's a big, whopping, all right. <clears throat> so we have here the Word of God saying, that God's response to his word is always yes when you come in faith. Always. He doesn't waver. He doesn't go, well, you know, I mean, look, I mean, Copeland just about bankrupt heaven this morning with that new project he, he talked about on television. God, God that, that, no, what, what Copeland needs, God's got. You know, there's a, there's a statement in the Bible that, you know, uh, that um, where Whatever you ask my name, I will do it. If you go to the French Bible and translate that back into English, it says this, that when you come to God, whatever your need is, when you ask him, and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit, but it ends up saying like this, if I don't have it, I'll make it for you. That, that's, that's, the, that's the way it idioms, and that's the way it comes back out of French into English. If I don't have it, I'll make it for you. So if Copeland bankrupt heaven, God just makes more. There's never going to be a lack of God fulfilling his promises to you just because there's a big, what you think is a bigger need over here. Dear Lord, God just, I mean, God just gave, you know, Rainbow Bible Church $5 million and all I need is 50000 and I ain't going to get a penny. So you, know, you, you got to get your eyes off what's going on around you. God said, if you'll give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Man, I'll give it to your bosom. Amen. My God should supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When you come to God with his word, his answer is yes. Y'all here, you're going home. His answer is yes. He's not wavering. He's like, oh no, I don't know what I'm going to do. Sandy just showed up. Oh man, and I just, Pastor Ed got here two minutes before her and he wiped out the whole, I mean, petty cash account. What am I going to do? God's not up there wavering. God's not uptight. There is limitless resources in the hands of God. That's why he promised things with absolute, I mean, just absolutely no problem at all saying certain things. When he said, I, my God, I meet your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's anybody that came on based on faith on that, they're going to get their need met according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And he's not wavering. He's not going, well, you know, I, I did say that. And, and you know, and, and um, uh, you know, Paul wrote that down, and it became part of the canon. And, uh, but, you know, I, I, I kind of changed my mind. Jesus Christ, the same. Yes. Yesterday, today, and forever. God said the old covenant, and it carries over to the new. I am the Lord, and I change not. Amen. The only difference between the compound covenant names of God and the old covenant and the new covenant is the old covenant was a covenant with natural man where he had to be and God outside their circumstances blessing them to the new covenant he's moved in on the inside and he's still doing all those things. He did not stay, stop being Jehovah Rapha the Lord that healeth thee just because we got to a new covenant. He didn't stop being your provider because we came into a new covenant. Why? That's who he is. 
Even, even um, Schofield, in his study notes on the terms of salvation, um, the sozo in the, in, in the Greek and then the Hebrew uh, equivalent, and then, he talk, and then he got talking about, uh, from that point, he got in talking about Jehovah. He said that Jehovah is the, is, the, is the name of the covenant God. It is a self-revelation. A, a, a going on, a progressive revelation. I'm using terms that he didn't use, but this is what he said, basically. That all the compound names were progressive self-revelations of who God is. If he's the Lord that heals in the Old Testament, he did not stop being the healer because we got to the new. If he was the provider in the old, he didn't stop being the provider when we got to the new. Everybody wants to take Jehovah to sit, can you? In the new, the Lord our righteousness. It's amazing how people cherry pick for their doctrine. See, if he was our righteousness in the old, he is our righteousness in the new. If he was our peace in the old, he's our peace in the new. If he was our banner of victory in the old, he is our banner of victory in the new. If he is our deliverer in the old, he's our deliverer in the new. If he is our, what, healer in the old, he's our healer in the new. If he's our Jehovah Jireh, our provider in the old, he's our provider in the new. Glory to God. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Now, that particular means he's change. God is not a man he should lie. If he said it, if he promised it, now let me understand this, and, he, and, I, and I, I truly believe this. I know there are a lot of people who don't believe this. I believe there are conditions to the Word of God. I do. The primary condition for the New Testament believer is the condition of faith. Now, there's some other things we'll, get for, you know, we'll cover later on, uh, and some things we might cover, but you know what? The first condition is a condition of faith. If you come in faith, Based on God's Word, his answer is yes. Amen? His, his answer is yes. His answer will not, he won't waver. He won't say, well, you know, I changed my mind last week. My answer is yes. Aren't you glad his answer is yes and not no? That his answer is yes and not maybe? And I, I'll tell you, I, we used to say that with such, such authority. You know, God answers prayer three ways. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, and sometimes maybe, oh yes, amen, hallelujah. That's right, preacher. And we wouldn't even get scripture for it. And people would walk out the door and believe it. And here's the thing. Anything they were going through at that moment, they were, they were studying or finding out from God or trying to get into the Word of God, just got knocked out of them. Because the preacher said, sometimes God says no. But the Scripture says that when you come in faith based on the Scripture, the Scripture says the answer is yes. He's not wavering. Amen. He's not wavering. He's not uptight. He's not going to lie to you. Y'all hear? Uh, nah. I want to get into the next one, but I'm going to wait until next Sunday morning. Hallelujah. Why? Because it's going to take too long to cover it. And uh, <clears throat> we don't have any witness for anybody to follow us, so I'm going to raise you from the dead and have a Holy Ghost service. That was a joke. <laughs> That we have, well, I couldn't hear the last part. That's right, more than enough. That's right. Through his poverty, we might be made rich. Amen. Jesus paid the price to, to obtain and apprehend for us all the blessings of God in a covenant between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Boy, that takes a lot of pressure off. Amen. Our, our number one condition of receiving from God, as I said earlier, is coming in faith. Amen.